In the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Ukrainian forces have made limited advances on land, but at sea, it's a different story. This video appearing to show major damage that Ukraine has done to Russia's navy. Ukrainians uh, say that their footage here captures today's sinking of a Russian warship, the Caesar Kunikov, just off of Crimea. The military says the warship and these other vessels are among 26 that Ukraine has taken down, claiming their forces have disabled one third of Russia's Black Sea fleet. Today's attack, according to officials, was carried out out by sea drone, which have been critical since Ukraine has no navy, no navy, and yet taking out, it says, one third of the Black Sea fleet. The Kremlin not commenting on today's incident and CNN cannot verify Ukraine's account. Let's turn now to retired Army Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling. He's a former commander of the U.S. Army Europe and the 7th Army. He is a CNN military analyst as well. Uh, put this into perspective for us, if you would, General Ukraine, saying it's destroyed one third of the Black Sea fleet. How significant is that overall when we know that things have really stalled out uh, on the battleground? Yeah, Brian, I'll do my best as an Army guy commenting on Navy operations. But when we're talking about the Black Sea fleet, that is the pride of the Russian Navy. And as the Ukrainians have said, they've destroyed, uh, I, I heard 25, you just said 26. But they also said they have uh, put out of action with a uh, need for repair an additional 15. The Black Sea Fleet has about 80 ships. And since the start of this conflict, the ones that the Ukraine has, has sunk, uh, obviously early on, the Muska, uh, the one today, the Kunikov, the Gormiak, the Minsk, all troop carrying large, very large troop carrying ships, which are important on the Black Sea because there are other countries that uh, Russia tries to influence with potential attacks. But they've also sunk the Rostov-on-Don, a submarine, tugboats, missile carriers and cruisers, a, a corvette. So these are not small vessels uh, that the Ukrainian, uh, uh, let's call them the Ukrainian Navy. They're, they're actually unmanned uh, vehicles, unmanned ships have been sinking. But this is a significant effect. All of these boats and ships are going to cost in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So they've taken out quite a bit of Russia capability on the Black Sea. Yeah, and let's put up, we have a map of the Black Sea so we can look at this. I mean, you called it the, the Navy, but you sort of hesitate because to borrow a term from my colleague Alex Marquardt, these are kind of like souped up jet skis. I mean, this is like a fleet of commercially available, right? These are not, these are not military uh, souped up jet skis. These are commercially repurposed vehicles that are being used in groups to take on these ships. But what is the objective? What does this uh, achieve when they do this? Well, it, it does a couple of things. First of all, it affects the Russians' ability to resupply in the area. Again, the, the ship, the Kunikov, that was hit this morning, uh, it has a crew of 87, but it also carries things like troop formations, hundreds of troops, uh, vehicles, supplies, equipment. So if Ukraine can affect the logistics capability of the Russian Navy to resupply by sea, it's a significant advantage. But secondly, it's just screwing with, truthfully, the, the Russian capability to have effects on land because these ships dock somewhere and they support things. But it's also confounding uh, the Russian Navy in this body of water, what they call their Russian lake. Uh, what's interesting though, is it will affect other uh, countries in the area. When you take a look at the boundaries of the Black Sea, you have Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova, Ukraine, Turkey. And Russia has said that, uh, you know, there's limited number of ships that can come into these waters, not so fast. The other thing is Ukraine is doing this with, as you said, a ship that's a little bit bigger than a, than a jet ski. It's about the size of a Sea-Doo filled with 500 kilograms of ammunition that can blow a large hole in a ship. The Ukrainians are not the first ones to do this, but they have perfected it, adapted it by putting these ships under the control of remotely piloted uh, uh, capabilities from the shore, traveling a couple of hundred miles to hit these ships. And what's most interesting to me is in many of the cases, the Russian Navy has not attempted to defend themselves against these ships. We see U.S. ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden defending themselves against Iranian remotely piloted vehicles. It doesn't seem like Russia has been capable of shooting these ships out of the water, which is pretty significant.
Yeah, it's it's pretty strange stuff. And, and I wonder, you know, because the, the benefit here is they don't have the Russian threat to their commerce uh, as close as it was before. So that's something that the Ukrainians can continue to do. They can continue to ship grain and the like uh, out into the Black Sea. I wonder, though, if this also, does this send a message? Maybe it doesn't, but I wonder if this sends a message to allies here in the U.S. as aid for Ukraine is hung up, that this is Ukraine saying, look, we're doing what we can with what we have, but we need more. Does it send any message that is heard here? Yeah, it's In my belief, it certainly does. It is sending that message that, hey, we're still fighting. We're trying to uh, survive. Uh, we are using adaptability and these kind of inexpensive, in, inexpensive pieces of equipment to continue to inflict damage on the Russia. You should support us. But the other thing I'd say, Brian, I'd go one step further and to say, this is helping Ukraine pause the gap. And what I mean by that is they are trying to bridge when the West is giving them their equipment versus the future and when they might start receiving it again. If there's a delay in continuing to equip the land force, the things that are required for, man for maneuver and to retake ground versus just blow things up at sea, this will be a good uh, strategy to just delay uh, and, and, and beg for more space for the time uh, until they get new manufacturing plants up within Ukraine, new ammunition and pieces of equipment from the West. Uh, this is a bridging strategy, in my view, uh, from the Ukrainian government. How is Ukraine's military getting by overall? Uh, we've heard, of course, word that they're running out of artillery, they're running out of bullets, they're on the front lines. What does this mean for their objectives? Yeah, it, it's fascinating, Brown. As you know, I've been watching this from the very beginning, and there were some very good victories early on. It has slowed a little bit. I still think uh, and still know that the Ukrainian forces are fighting very vehemently and with a lot of energy against the Russians, but they have been depleted in terms of their ammunition and their personnel. And they were throwing a lot of things together, new equipment, new forces on the, on the battlefield against the Russian force that seemingly should have been prepared. But truthfully, because Russia's forces were so bad early on, they were, uh, Ukraine was able to take an advantage. Now it's, it's paused because Ukraine is trying to get new mobilization of forces, improved maneuver capabilities with new aspects, more ammunition. They're asking for everything. They literally have to, to get everything on the ground because the key purpose, remember, is, is not necessarily to blow up ships on the Black Sea. That certainly helps from a logistics standpoint, but their main objective is to regain their sovereign territory. That is their strategy. And whereas you can do that by, uh, you can help that by blowing up ships, that doesn't help you take another foot of ground or another yard of dirt. And that's their main objective as they continue with this fight. Uh, General Hurtling, great to have you uh, here to discuss these new developments. We appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Brenna.